and we'll get to this in a moment, uh, as a text in Proverbs chapter 7, verses 6 through 23. Proverbs 7, 6 through 23. Now, having done that, I would like to read a few verses from Proverbs. In Proverbs 4, <coughs> in verse 7, Proverbs 4, 7, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. One point about that, that's something I must do. I must learn how to do it. I must be able to recognize wisdom from foolishness. Then if you go on over a ways into Proverbs, chapter 16, and in verse number 16, the writer said, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold? Notice that's an exclamation. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? And to get understanding rather than to be chosen than silver. Again, something we must desire to get. We must know how to get it. We must pursue it. Then in uh, chapter 19 and verse 8. Chapter 19, verse 8 reads, He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. That's not in that verse, but did you notice back earlier? Did you notice back earlier? A false witness shall not go be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. Now let me ask you a question. Is it wise to tell falsehoods with the intent to deceive as if what you tell is the truth? Well, we would immediately say no. We would immediately see it condemned. We would immediately be able to see that that's just, well, why are you up here preaching? Except to preach against such a thing. But now notice what is said just before that, that I started reading. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. Well, is part of that understanding to tell the truth? To not tell falsehoods with the intent to deceive as if what you're telling is the truth, but you know better? Wisdom can be applied in so many ways relative to what it is to live a godly life. There are multitudinous details to being a wise man or woman or a wise child, whether boy or girl. Or being wise in whatever capacity maybe your work takes you into and how you work with others around you and how you perform the job. Wisdom usually doesn't come overnight. But wisdom will be found not in lies but in pursuing the truth regarding whatever it may be. I want you to consider when we describe the character of a person. Sometimes we compare those characters to animals because those animals exhibit similar traits. Maybe you... Uh, you did this once, or maybe your children have, or grandchildren. The children were outside playing, and they found a mud puddle, and there has been a child in the mud puddle that didn't get together. And then they show up at the door, and you see them. Maybe you say something like, you're as dirty as a pig. I would have been met at the door with more than that, but I might have wished I hadn't seen that mud puddle. But be that as it is, we do things like that. Now, why do we say, well, you're as filthy or dirty as a pig, or you look like you've been wallowing with the hogs? We want to get a point across. We want to be understood. You might be warned about someone in business, another businessman, because 
Well, he's as slippery as an eel. And when someone doesn't get his way, of course the other person is as stubborn as a mule. Now you say, but most people around me, they would know a mule from a Shetland pony. But a lot of times these phrases have come on down to us if all you are is a sidewalk child or you spend your time in front of a computer. They still are used. Now let me tell you something. In studying the Bible and understanding God's Word, you better understand some of these phrases. Here's why. Jesus called Herod a fox in Luke 13, 32. Judah was called a lion's whelp, Genesis 49, 9. Issachar was a strong ass, Genesis 49, 14. And the way things are nowadays and the vulgar language is going on, you'll have to explain how that word is used. Dan was a serpent by the path. We might understand that. Genesis 49, 17. Naphtali was a deer on the loose. Genesis 49, 21. Benjamin was a ravenous wolf. Genesis 49, 27. Now you go read those and you study that and you don't understand the fox, the lion, swept, the strong ass, the serpent by the path, the deer on the loose or the ravenous wolf, and you won't understand what's going on. You'll not understand the text. Well, when we come to Proverbs 7, 6 through 23, we will be nice to the young man that is described in those passages. We will simply call him a naive, extremely naive young man. Now we get the picture. Solomon is looking out his window. And he saw this, the Bible says, foolish young man. Proverbs 7, 6 through 10 of our passage. And we find out that there is a woman of unsavory character who solicits him to go with her for ulterior motives. And you know, it just did not take the woman long to convince the young man to follow her into her house, verses 21 through 23. Solomon, upon seeing this, viewing it, reminded, it reminded him of several similar things. And remember the passages we read about wisdom. The importance of wisdom. How we must get wisdom. It should be sought above gold and silver. This young man should have been wise, but he was not. He's like a great many people. Young and old, but especially young people. As an ox led to the slaughter. That's an interesting term. Notice it again, uh, animal is used. How many of you have ever been to a slaughterhouse? Few of you have. You know, every one of those animals that went there had no idea what was about to happen to them. And when they stood waiting in line to go be killed, they were most of them content to sit there and chew their cud as if nothing else is going along or they're back out in the pasture or in the barn about to be fed. So as an ox is being led to the slaughterhouse or to the butcher, that ox is just as content to follow the farmer as if he were being led out to the pasture. Now remember though the significance of this, he's talking about human beings when he's doing this, it's in the Word of God to teach you and me about sometimes how a lot of us are. Relative to are we wise or are we foolish? The ox is unaware of what's happening to him. Some of us, I don't know how many, 
watch the veterinarian Dr. Pohl. And that's interesting to me. But something he pointed out several times in different shows when they had to remove the leg of an animal, a dog, a cat. And he will point out to them, they will never miss their leg. Well, I think I'd miss my arm. <coughs> when I had my surgery on this wrist, it was sure incapacitating for a long time while it healed. But have you, have you ever noticed? If you don't watch this show, you can see. He removed a whole shoulder and leg, sewed the thing up, and he leaves the office bouncing along like the same way he was when he came in. Yeah, but he's an animal. But don't you see people almost acting the same way in different areas of their life and what they get themselves into? There was a movie here a while back, and you've known this to be the case, where a fellow was having to go fight. And he's lamenting and trying to figure out how to get out of it because he's in the army. And he absolutely says, I didn't get in this to be a soldier. I got into it to get the educational benefits. Didn't he know that's not the reason the army exists? Didn't he understand that when you are in the armed forces, their primary reason and fundamental reason, the only reason they really exist is to fight when the time comes to fight? But he thought he would get in, and then when he had to go... He was trying all sorts of ways to get out. Even after he was uh, signed and deployed, he slammed a car door on his hand and broke it, so he hoped they'd send him home. <laughs> that shows you how some people, well, the ox led to the slaughter. Young people are sometimes led off blindly, unaware of any danger that would result. They don't think about, well, if this starts while I'm there, what's going to happen to my family when I'm doing this, that, or the other? Who's going to take care of my wife? Or else they're thinking, it never happened to me. And sometimes they drag their own family right, right into the thing with them, whatever it may be. You know, sometimes we talk about armed forces, they, they go in harm's way they go in harm's way sometimes we choose to go in harm's way we don't have to go in harm's way and we don't even know maybe what's motivating us in our minds to make that choice and especially you could sure put some other people out if harm does come to us you know she talks about a fool to the correction stock you know, they weren't too politically correct in those days. They still put people in prison and beat them and put them in the stocks. But he doesn't connect his current actions to the later consequences. Most crooks don't. They just see what they can get for the moment. And they don't think about what's coming as a consequence. The law of intended unintended consequences gets a lot of people. Now in the same way this young man's focused on the promise of this young man here that Solomon saw he's focused on the promise of pleasure for the moment. He doesn't think about the embarrassment or the pain that this might bring to him and others around about him. It's just for the moment. He also talks about a man struck in his liver by an arrow. Well, you've got to remember in these days, uh, they weren't killing at long distance. About the longest distance, distance there was might be an arrow. Most of it was up close and personal killing. But you can see they knew what major organs needed to be hit to bring somebody down in a hurry. The liver is a vital organ. But it's a little late to wait until an arrow has damaged the liver to realize the danger. A little bit late then. And in the same way, this young man that Solomon saw won't listen to reason. 
nor think to take steps to protect himself until after the irreversible damage is done. Are there people like that today? Certainly there are. He then talks about a bird being caught in a snare. Well, how does he get caught in the snare? Well, he's going to see some kind of bait, and he's interested in the bait and getting there before some other bird gets it. I always think about, and sorry if you haven't been around a flock of chickens, but I used to take a grandmother's old biscuits that had got hard, and they didn't lay around usually that long get hard, but sometimes they did. And they always had chickens, and I'd like to throw them out there in the midst of them, and man, that'd be a war. <coughs> Looked like a political convention. And that was fun to me. I wasn't as mean as my grandfather. He used to take biscuits. He said, of course, you know, this is over 100 years ago, well over 100 years ago, and not much entertainment. And he'd throw the old biscuits out. He had a large family. The dog would grab them. He'd throw three or four biscuits out. The dog would grab them. Then he'd throw a white rock. He said, sure could hear it clattering the teeth. But farm boys tend to do things like that. But now think of the dog for a minute. His assumptions that everything thrown in him that was white would be a biscuit because the first three or four were. So the bird sees the bait and thinks only to get quickly to it and get it before anybody beats him to it. You think of these seagulls, mine, 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 mine. Well, in, uh, if you haven't seen that show, you just have to go see it. In his eagerness, eagerness, he doesn't see the trap. He doesn't see the trap. People walk off into things like that all the time. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as wise, but as fools. Is that what it says? That's the way we live. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming, buying back the time for the days are evil. Now, that was written about 2,000 years ago. Are the days still evil? Do Christians need to examine the whole circumference of a thing before they walk off in? Don't, another phrase, get in water over your head. Especially if you can't swim. And in the same way, this young man's eager for sex. He sees the opportunity and rushes headlong toward it. Doesn't even see the trap. When I think about it for a moment, what happens in these cases? The danger is not so subtle that it cannot be seen. The problem is that the person is so caught up in momentary pleasure or whatever else it might be, but in this case, momentary pleasure, that he becomes completely unaware of surrounding environment. You know, I like military and things like that and always have like history. And I've read, I've read a number of books. I couldn't tell you how many. Sometimes it's about battle scenes. And some of the people get shot when they're acting like they're not in the battleground. They're paying no attention. They've gotten so used to what goes on in the midst of a war that they are going along acting like they're not on the front lines. And they get shot or blown up or something. Uh, the church, let's see, is the army of the Lord fighting the fight of faith. <clears throat> Satan is our adversary and he's after us every second of every minute of every day of every week of every year till we die. But how do we act? Solomon points out the many, that many strong men have been pulled down by sexual sins. Proverbs 7, 26. Surely in the church and in the home, we ought to be trying to teach and train and warn people about such things. But there are many others. You know, an ox is a very strong animal. He's a, he's a mighty beast. But strength can't save him when he doesn't engage his mind. And the choices we make many times may appear on the surface to be fine things. But we don't realize what it's getting us into. The example we set where we want 
our son or our children to go and do the same thing. Do we want them to grow up doing these things? So we need to be aware of Satan's schemes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul urged the Corinthian brethren to forgive those who wronged them because he says Satan would take advantage of their division. When people repent, forgive them. If you don't, you're giving Satan an advantage. And when you know you're in sin, repent. You don't want to give Satan an advantage. He's already got you, so get rid of it and don't give an advantage because you would be leavening for bad in the church in which you fellowship. So it's a preventable advantage because Christians ought to be aware of Satan's schemes, of his devices. It's the wicked one that we must know is our greatest adversary. We cannot get caught up in the ways of the wicked who are the servants of Satan. So we must be looking for sin, beginning first in our own lives, Proverbs 4.19. There are other people um, all around us who face troubles, but they can't handle it and they don't know how to face them. And so they turn to drinking and drugs to dull the pain of living. You know, it's only a momentary escape. It just plunges you deeper into other problems and builds greater problems. The intelligence is dull by such thing. It stifles their connection with reality. So they aren't even able to tell when they're hurt. Proverbs 23 and 35. And yet we're taught over and over again to be sober. It doesn't mean not uh, to not be drunk with alcohol. That covers that. But it means whatever you do with your life... Be able to think straight and to consider the reality and who you are as a child of God before you step off into this. Those committing sexual sins are also caught up in pleasure. So caught up in it they can't see the death around them. Proverbs 9.18 Others in a rush for wealth take shortcuts as they see them. And they're completely unaware of financial disasters awaiting them. Proverbs 28, 22. And it's always easy to take somebody else's money and spend it like you want to. You didn't have to work for it. If they thought about God at all, they thought God won't notice. Isaiah brings that out about the people of his day in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 28. They think of God as a man. And they can pull the wool over his eyes. And the sad part about it is they had gone so far into sin that when God punished them, it made no impact for good. That was the state of Judah and Jerusalem when it was under siege by Nebuchadnezzar. So Jeremiah brings out in chapter 5 of Jeremiah, verses 3 and 4. Another thing is that a foolish person trusts in himself. Have you ever noticed, we're talking about oxen, that in Isaiah 1 and verse 3, that God complained that Israel was dumber than an ox. Israel turned to idols and obvious falsehood. And God asked, why? Isaiah 40 and verse 21. We've been studying on Wednesday night a lot about Deuteronomy. The restatement of the law. Been brought out by Jeff when he preaches once a month here. Reminding the people of the law. They go over to the land and they live like the people they're casting out. They're going to suffer the same fate. And of course they say, we will not. We'll keep thy commandments. We'll obey thy statutes. But they didn't. They were wise, if you please, in their own conceit. And it brought blindness to Israel. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. God's way was visible to them in the law of Moses. But they couldn't grasp it because it didn't interest them. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9. When people are ignorant of God's righteousness, guess what they do? They make their own, Romans 10 and verse 3. Man's going to have some kind of standard that guides him. If he rejects God's standard, he'll set up his own standard. Same thing's true of religion, which basically is a standard for way of life and your view of deity. When faced with truth, they speak evil of it because they don't understand it. 2 Peter 2 and verse 12, and Peter warns Christians, they won't understand why, how could you be this before and now... You're diametrically different from what you were. 
Man just is not able because he puts himself in certain positions to see the path of safety, the way to heaven, Proverbs 20 and 24. And so even Christians, those who heard it from the heart, believed and obeyed the gospel and lived it, were warned to take heed lest you fall. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. So most of the New Testament is written to people like us if we're Christians. They keep us faithful. And if we would stay close with it, stay close with the book, spend time with it, meditating on it, then we would see what the dumb ox can. That the choices we're making are choices that have nothing to do with seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The last point is that Brethren, do not have to be ignorant of God's Word. Brethren, do not have to love something more than God's Word or God. And of course they ought not, but many do. The world outside of Christ, Paul presents them in Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, is walking in darkness. That means the absence of light, which means the absence of the light of the gospel. They're doing their own thing, and that is the... Model of the age. Well, we, we should not. We must not if we were to grow up in Christ. And if heaven would be our home, allow Satan to blind us to the truth that's all around us. Peter urges Christians to be this way. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. He says, this is the way if you do these things, ye shall never fall. But an entrance will be made for you. But it involves my love of God, my love of the things of God, my love of the Word of God being one of those things and the time it takes to understand it. For if I don't, I will set up my own standards. And I will judge myself and others in the light of my own standards. You say, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, if you don't know the Bible, you can't certainly judge it by the Bible. So what are you judging it by? Because I tell you, you will judge yourself and others. So we ought to see God's goodness. It's one of the things that leads us to repentance, to turn from ways contrary to God's ways. Romans 2, 2 through 4. We ought to see the love of God and the mercy of God. God's never done anything but good to man. Man left God by sinning against him. Man's brought all of this upon himself. And God still loved us and sent his only begotten son as a man to, to die for us, suffering and dying on the cross. It's hard to really grasp why God would do that, except it helps me understand the worth of one soul. For what shall a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for a soul? Now we started out with verses pertaining to wisdom, what it is to be wise. Now let me ask you, in the choices you're making regarding this one time you've got through life to show God you love Him and that you have faith in Him and His system of salvation, the gospel system, are you being wise? As a family, are you being wise? As a husband, are you wise in the choices you're making, knowing that, that the ultimate wisdom is knowing the Word of God? Same thing's true of a wife or parents or children. Children get old enough to know right from wrong. They can start learning what it is to be wise. There are passages in the Bible addressed to them, such as Ephesians 6, that tells them how to conduct themselves regarding their parents. But when we go ally ourselves with things of this present world, then we can't be giving the attention to the Lord's cause that we ought to. And whatever there is, you know, Jeff's talking about Things that shouldn't be seen of your, on your body. Said if it shouldn't be seen covered up. Well if there are things here in this world. That draws your attention away. From the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Get out of it. Make everything secondary. And subsidiary. To the interest of our Lord. That's what it means to seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what it means to put Christ first. 
Just don't involve yourself. Even in things that are not sinful, don't let them require of your time and talents what ought to be applied to finding heaven. Because all this is going to pass away. And you have no assurance you'll be here this afternoon or tomorrow. And someday you will not. Then look back now from that standpoint and say, is my life such that I'm ready to step into eternity and meet my maker at the judgment? That's how serious it is about living life. If you're a Christian, that's a wonderful thing. But if you're not, you can be before you leave this building. If you're humble enough to receive the truth of God's word and the commands of God that you must obey to become a Christian. To first of all believe in him based upon his word, Romans 10, 17. To repent of your sins, a commandment of God in Acts 17 and verse 30. To confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10 and verse 10. And to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins. More than that, he does require of you to become a Christian. Less than that, and you cannot become a Christian. He will add you to his church when you're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. And there you can faithfully serve him. If as a child of God you haven't been too wise, maybe you've been more like that ox led to the slaughter. And we urge you to repent of whatever sins that you've gotten yourself into. Turn from them, come back to the Lord and confessing them and praying God for forgiveness. We invite you to do that now while we stand and sing.